Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to SDU Group's Masterclass in Forecasting. I hope you can all uh, hear me okay and you've downloaded the, the software. We can see a good number of you are on already, probably waiting for a few more uh, joiners. I'm David Bloom. I'm the uh, co-founder of SDU Group. That's me on the left there on the screen. I've been a CFO for nearly 20 years now, scarily. I've uh, worked in lots of different companies, different sizes, um, different parts of the world. Forecasting has been a, a central part of, uh, of my job. With me today is uh, Chris Spinks. Hi, everybody. That's Chris on the right there. Chris is also a qualified accountant, um, spent many years with Baker Tilly, and over the last few years, we've worked very closely together, building models for a good number of uh, our clients, both large and small. And today, you're going to benefit from uh, our collective wisdom, particularly Chris's. Uh, as most of you know, um, FDU Group places finance professionals from CFOs to part qualifiers into companies of all sizes. And we do that on a part-time, an interim, and a full-time basis. All of you on the call today have had some experience with FDU Group. We've placed some of you guys, we've interviewed you, and or we've got your details on file. But you're part of our growing network. I'm very glad to have you on board. What you may not know about this is we also have a support service called Finance Gopher, which you can find at www.financegopher.com. That's Gopher with an S, not a PH. Uh, Gopher offers tools, know-how, templates, research, and live support to help you guys develop personally, professionally, and financially. Much of the content is free. You should check out the site in your own time. Uh, I'd like to say hi to the new people that have just joined us. You haven't missed much, guys. Thanks a lot. One of the tools we've just launched is Go Forecast. Go Forecast is an Excel-based hosted forecasting tool that we've built, and it's actually the uh, underlying tool that we're going to demonstrate in this masterclass today. Before we dive in, just a couple of bits of housekeeping. Uh, we've got quite a big audience we can see, so if you have got any questions, please type them in. You should see on the Citrix software uh, a space to ask questions. We will collate those questions, and at the end, we will do our best to answer them. Any in-depth questions, we'll uh, get in touch with you separately. I'm going to talk for about 40 minutes, uh, go through the model, the forecasting, and take those questions uh, at the end. If you have any problems with the technology, uh, I can only apologize. You can put a question in, but uh, it's going to be down to your broadband connection and, uh, and audio. So let's dive straight in. Before I hand over to Chris, just want to talk about uh, this little matrix here. What are my options when it comes to uh, modeling? The two key criteria that always crops up in modeling is risk and customization. And that's what we've got in the matrix here. Starting in the bottom left-hand corner, you can buy off-the-shelf products. Some of you may have heard of Wind Forecast, which is a stage offering. There are others. Fairly cheap. You can get them for under a £1,000. Uh, fairly customizable, fairly low risk, but you are limited in terms of what you can do. I'm pretty sure everybody on this call uses Excel. It's the DIY version. We've all got it. Very cheap. You dive straight in, build your models, and uh, today is about how you improve. In the bottom right-hand corner, a couple of options. If you're working in a large company, uh, you may have spent tens or hundreds of thousands of pounds with a large ERP solution like a SAP, uh, and or you've got expert uh, Excel people that you've either got on the payroll or you bring them in, people such as Chris, uh, to help build models for you. And what we've done over the last sort of year or so is built something called Go Forecast, as I said, which we'll demonstrate today. It's an inexpensive um, solution. Okay. What are we going to cover today? Four key areas. The importance of customization, minimizing risk when you're forecasting, formulae, we'll just scratch the surface on that topic, it's the subject of a, another masterclass, and tracking performance. Uh, with that, I'm delighted to hand over to Chris. Thank you, David. Hello, everybody. Um, today, we'll be diving straight into Excel, okay? It'll be a live demonstration using Excel itself, and we're going to get, get out of the slide. So, um, David said we can't really scratch the surface of formally, and he's right, and we really can't really scratch the surface of Excel. There's so much that you can do with Excel. So today, with the limited time that we've got, um, we're trying to give you some good tips and tricks, but also really the fundamental modeling best practices that can primarily minimize risk. Um, but we'll just 
dive into Go Forecast, and we'll just touch on the importance of customization. So bear with me as I just select Go Forecast. And to be clear, Go Forecast is an Excel workbook. It's just Excel. Um, it's a self-contained workbook. Um, why are we using Go Forecast today? We're not using Go Forecast today because, or we are using Go Forecast today, sorry, because um, we don't just want to show you the theory, we don't just want to talk about the theory, we actually want to show you it in practice. So this, this tool incorporates all of the modeling best practices that we're going to go through today. So David talked about four sections, customization, minimizing risk, formally, and tracking performance. Customization really, firstly, this is a high level, this one page dashboard, which I'm pointing to at the bottom, this dashboard is a high level one page summary of all of the model's calculations with some summary financial statements on the right here, some charts, and some other key inputs. Okay, um, just a demonstration of customization. I can lay this report out as I like, um, and I think that's what's great about Excel. I can structure it just as I like, and I think with any Excel product, you should have a one-page high-level summary that gives you an overview of some detailed data. Okay, um, but the really the most important thing for me in customization is key business drivers Okay, your turnover number within your P&L account should hopefully be the largest number in your P&L account. And if it is, it's therefore probably going to be one of the largest numbers in your entire forecast. Therefore, it should have a lot of time spent on it in order to make sure that you've got it right, so that your forecasts are materially correct. Um, how do you get it right? Well, um, it comes down to what's driving your business. And I think this is where a lot of the off-the-shelf products fall over because they don't give you ultimate flexibility in order to calculate turnover in however many steps that I need in order to calculate turnover. And that's what's great about Excel. Let's build in those key business drivers, those number of steps that are relevant to my business in order to work out turnover. And in this example, we've got Go Forecast that's tailored for an online business. Okay, and Go Forecast is designed to be tailored to different businesses. But in this example, we're showing that this business, and in our forecast, we're assuming lots of application downloads that's given us an active user base. And those users, depending on how long they're with us, their life of, of being a user, are then actually generating us some income. Okay, and we've just got some high level, because we've got those business drivers in the model, we've got some high level key performance indicators that can come out of the model as a result. And so we can use that to start sense checking the numbers that are in our P&L. Okay, average amount per user is decreasing over time. And, and if that's relevant to your business, then that's something that can help you understand that turnover number. Okay, so they're really important, and also you can then, having built them in, actually start to sensitize them. And why would you want to sensitize or run a what-if scenario? Why would you want to do that? So you can make decisions. Um, what would happen if I lost 20% of the application downloads that went through? What would happen to my business performance? I've got negative cash of around, minimum negative cash of minus. £10,000 and my income in year five has dropped to 1.6 when it was, if I put that back to zero, it was at 2 million. So it's made a £400,000 difference to year five turnover and it gave me a negative cash position of minus 10k. What about if the life of my users within these numbers, within these steps, if the life of my users was to be one month shorter or two months shorter? Oops. Minus, minus two months, okay, so two months less life. If they weren't there as long, so we had less active users, what would then happen to the income? And um, we can see there that our, our, our business is really driven by the life of the active users and less driven by the number of application downloads. Okay, it's just an example. It's specific to an online business, and um, it's designed for decision-making. Once you get those key business drivers in, you can then start to make decisions by sensitizing those key business drivers. Chris, just a quick question for you. Um, when you're building a model, do you find you begin with the KPIs and what you want the outputs to be and then work out the detail? Or do you dive straight in and sort of build it up from scratch? Because it's great summary information here. Do you kind of put this in your mind before you then build out the rest of the tool? Okay. Um, well, every model that I build will always have a high-level summary page. So I always know I'll, I will result in this sort of format because it just gives that user that high-level overview. But how would I know what KPIs to pull out? Well, that's obviously specific to the business and how I would try to work out those KPIs. For me, it's to sit down on a piece of paper and just think of one transaction. So one active user, one application download, what does that do? That then comes into an active user, live 
amount per active user, just about one person through my financial forecast. If I understand that completely, and the working capital effect of those, if I understand that completely, then I should then really start to understand how to model it. So lock down the basic business model first and then build out from there? 100%. And okay. it's actually a good way to review a model, is actually just to put one transaction through and see what happens with the numbers. Yeah. Does it make sense? Does it make sense? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so that's customization, and really the most important part, get those key business drivers into your forecast. Okay, now we're on to minimizing risk. We're on to section two, and this is the biggest section, and I'm going to actually split this section into two parts. The first part being minimizing risk once the model's built, and our user is now using it, so we've released it, it's in the operation stage, we're trying to minimize risk during this stage. Um, the key principle for me, if you're going to try and minimize risk at this stage when our user is using it, is transparency and understanding. Our user's got to be able to understand these numbers. If they understand the numbers, then there's more likelihood of them spotting a mistake in an assumption somewhere. So if your model is therefore easy to understand, there's more chance of them spotting mistakes and assumptions. So how do you make your model easy to understand? Well, it all comes down to structure and layout. Okay. Um, as we touched on at the start, Go Forecast is an Excel workbook. It's a self-contained Excel workbook. I don't have lots of other workbooks that are supporting this Excel workbook. There's no external links from this workbook to another workbook. Firstly, external links nearly always go wrong. Okay? Sometimes you have to have them, but if you can find a way not to have them within your model, then please try and avoid them like the plague because they just often go wrong. But from a user's side, in terms of transparency, if you've got lots of assumptions contained in other workbooks, that user has to open up those workbooks in order to understand those assumptions. So it becomes a little bit less transparent, so that naturally increases risk. Um, the next part with structural layout is worksheets. How many worksheets have you got in your, in your workbook? Um, we go forecast, we don't have many at all, and, and that's the idea. Just reduce the number of worksheets. Don't have lots and lots of worksheets for the user to get lost on. Oh, where does this data flow from this sheet? Where does it come from? And, and just it just slows you down, makes it harder to understand. So please do try and minimize worksheets. Also, which we'll touch on in the next section, lots of worksheets increase risk in the design and build stage, but I shall come on to that. Um, Go Forecast has got inputs, calculations, and outputs. Those, um, that's, that's another key model and best practice. Separate your inputs from your calcs and from your outputs. Why do you want to do that? Straight away, if my user knows that all of their assumptions are on these yellow sheets, then they don't really need to go to the calc sheet. And what that means is any adjustments that they make are away from where all the risky areas is, where all of the main calcs are. So straight away, very quick um, way of increasing risk, they're only making changes in a controlled environment within the input sheet. Okay, so that's important. The next thing, if all of my users' inputs are on this one page, then that effectively becomes a tick list where they start from the top and work their way down the bottom of all of their inputs. And if they're all contained in one place, that means my user has considered every single input in order to then produce their numbers. If you have those inputs spread across lots of different calculation pages, across lots of different worksheets, the likelihood of the user remembering where all of those inputs are in order to make sure that they've got them right for today's numbers is really low. So there's going to be increased risk of them not updating an assumption when they should. So put it all in one place. But before we do dive on to that general inputs page, I'm just going to cover my outputs and the outputs that are coming as standard from Go Forecast, but really I think should come out as standard from nearly all models. And we've now just done to this annual outputs tab, there's, there's annual financial statement outputs and monthly financial statement outputs, pretty standard. Um, but firstly, key performance statistics, These, this is the benefit of putting those um, business drivers into the model. Because we've got them in, we can now start putting them out in more detail. I can actually start to see that I was launching into other platforms, which is driving my total application download. So that's helping the person who's used to using this model. That's helping them understand subscription fees and download fees and things like that. Okay, so KPIs, get them throughout the model, having incorporated your key business drivers. Next, we've got P&L account. We've got two cash flow statements and the balance sheet. Um, you may just be modeling your P&L budget. Okay? If you're modeling your P&L budget, great. Tie that into KPIs. Brilliant. You can stop there. But if you do want to start to model cash, and I do recommend you try and model cash as much as possible. It's one of the most important things, naturally. If you are going to model cash, never, ever, ever model cash without doing a balance sheet as well, fully integrated with the P&L and the, the cash flow statement. The reason why you would never do cash without a balance sheet is that um, 
So my income assumptions here, I can see they're increasing. My, I've got a receipts and payment style cash flow here. I can see my customer receipts are increasing, and that kind of makes sense. But I've seen it before in, with clients' models, and I only did p and on cash, that the balance sheet, because they didn't have that on there, they didn't see the really easy spot, which is trade debtors are um, decreasing over time. And that really does come out when um, you've got a P&L cash flow and a balance sheet. With all three of the financial statements integrated, it's really easy to start to see things that um, don't appear right. Okay, so never put cash in a model without a balance sheet as well. Um, but as well, I've got two cash flows in Go Forecast. Why do I have two cash flows in Go Forecast? One's a fairly easy to understand receipts and payment style cash flow. Another one is flow of funds basis cash flow. So start with profitability, working capital movements. And what that is, that's two different ways for a user to tend to check the movements in cash. So that's more transparency, that's more understanding for the user. There's a great benefit there of having both types of cash flow. But there's another benefit. If I have two cash flows calculated independently, the same closing cash figure, then that surely is just making a model more secure. I've got two cash flows there calculating the same closing cash number. So people can rely on that. Okay, so that's the structure of my outputs, really. Just before you move on, Chris, just, uh, I'm not sure if everyone in the audience knows, you've got the pluses down the left-hand side, which is the grouping functionality. Uh, but this high detail and show detail, is that a, a, a tool in Excel or is that a macro? Just explain what's going on there, because it's quite good the way this thing expands and uh, collapses. Okay, yeah, that's, that's just uh, a, a little button in Excel, but it's got a macro behind it in order to open up and, and show that section quickly. And, and it's a small macro that's just designed to increase usability. We could have clicked the plus, but it just gets a bit finicky. So if we have buttons over the model, okay, it just it. makes it nice and easy. So it's a feature of Go Forecast. Yeah, really, it's just something to increase usability. Um, and as well, I think with macros, which we're not really going to cover today, there's one model in most practice with macros. My flow cash figure in Go Forecast has been calculated entirely by for, uh, formulae. There is no macros at any point within the numbers. The macros in Go Forecast are just to increase the user experience. Okay, understand. Like these buttons. Okay. So um, separating the inputs, outputs, and calcs, there's some good benefits there. A final benefit to demonstrate my admin staff cost number. I have an admin staff cost number there. Does that make sense to me? Because I know all of my user inputs are on this page, um, it's very easy for me to just quickly go to those assumptions to tend to check that number. Now, if it's across lots of worksheets, you might have to go through lots of steps in order to then get to where your source assumptions are. But just cut those steps out, jump straight to the general inputs page where all of my users' assumptions are. And another. Um, another macro-based way to speed up the user again that just sits within Go Forecast. It's not standard, but I just can then start to, yeah, can then start to jump around the model to just speed you up further. So I'm going to jump to our admin staff cost assumption. Okay, so it's taken me to the general inputs page. It's opened up a road grouping where I want to go to. So straight away, admin staff cost, within a minute, I can quickly see that 239,000 is broken up by three people and another. Does that make sense to me? Um, my user might think that actually Joe Bloggs has come on too early, and within a minute, I've actually just identified possibly a, a, an error in my numbers. Very clear. Yeah. Okay. So, so separate your inputs. It means you can get to your underlying assumptions really quickly, and put a summary at the end, which is breaking down the numbers. Okay. I'm going to move Joe Bloggs back now to where he should have come in, which is January 14. Okay. That now makes sense to me. That 154k is now more as I expect. Yeah. And it's so often I've gone into board meetings five minutes before, and you want to understand where our numbers come from. And because of the way it's been built, it's hard to see that breakdown. But to, to jump straight there and see that in sort of seconds is, is very useful. Okay. Um, so that was a yellow cell. A yellow cell I changed. Now that I've directed my user onto this general inputs page, which contains all of their user assumptions, the next thing to do is to color code so that they know which cells they should be changing, which cells they should be changing, which is the yellow cells. So it's simple; it's not hard to do. But if you just um, always do it, then 
That's great. That's great. It just directs the user to tell them what to change. And as well, this is macro based, but there's just some user notes that are in the model that can tell them what to do. And the yellow cells are input. Please adjust those yellow cells. Um, simple user notes, color coding. Please do use it throughout and be consistent. The next, though, that was a drop down list, but I changed Joe Blog's wage to January 14. That drop down list is what is called data validation within Excel. And you can set those um, and set that list of available dates that people can forecast for this admin staff employee. Data validation is really powerful, and I use it lots within models. And what data validation is, is Excel itself validating the user's input. They know it's a, a yellow cell they need to get to, so this, um, this if I was to put in a date outside of the, the model period, we've only got a five-year model period, I'm, I'm starting in, in in January 20, that's outside of that date list. And this is Excel itself saying, no, that's not a valid entry. You need to either retry or cancel it to go back to what you had there before. That's powerful. That just minimizes risk. That stops them putting the wrong thing into a cell. And that red line at the top flags up when there's a, an error in the model. Is that what was going on there? Yeah. Now, now, now that red line at the top is actually the check system that's built into the model. There's another layer of validation. If Excel itself can validate individual cells, but you as a developer can put another check system on top, which is validating the entire model completely, not just individual cells. And to maybe demonstrate that a little bit different is if I try and, okay, so I employed Joe Blobs in January 14, but I stopped him in October 12, which just doesn't make sense. You turn back time. Yeah, so, so there's just simple formula-based check throughout the entire model, checking lots of stuff. And this is one of the checks that's in there. And whilst that's easy to see where we've made the error, the, the main benefit is that there's a red warning bar on the top of the model, and that there's a red warning bar everywhere. And that if ever um, there's a red warning bar, then the user knows within Go Forecast that has to go to the check system because something's not right. I can't rely on those figures. So let's just jump to that check system. And again, there's user notes in here to explain to the user what to do. So what we're going to do is open up the user input tests. So these are all the tests that are in the model that they can get wrong. And the one that's failed is test six. And this is all formula driven, but we're just going to use another macro here to present something to the user as to what's the details of test six. Well, test six is just verifying that start and stop date. So it's a check hmm. system that can direct the user and tell them what to do in order to resolve the problem in order to make all of the model be validated. Modeling best practice is to always have the right check systems in place, not just to go yeah. in and create the numbers. You've got to have the checks and balances. Yeah, and having now corrected that test, what that means is that my top bar is no longer red, and so that my users can rely on the numbers. And you're back on track. Got and it. we're back on track. So that's having released the model. They didn't break the model. They just put the wrong input cell. Yeah. And so it's good to have that in. And that check system is everywhere. It's covering, does the balance sheet balance? Does the cash, do the cash flows calculate the same figure, et cetera? So, um, Really important. Never release a model without one. Okay, and that's really the end of minimizing risk during the operation stage. We're now going to get a little bit more technical, and we're going to look at minimizing risk in the design and build stage. And we're really going to focus on the calculations part within a model. And rather than actually use the Go Forecast calculations page to demonstrate it, we're going to use a separate Excel workbook. Um, before we do, just need to be clear that really it's the same principles that minimize risk on the calculations page, and that is transparency and understanding. But because our user isn't there, it's really transparency and understanding for you as a developer. Um, and I shall explain that now. Okay, Structure and layout is key. Don't have lots and lots of worksheets within a model within your calculations page. Go forecast all of its main body of calcs are on one page. So um, jump into this simple example. This is why you don't want to have lots of worksheets. Okay, and it's called off-sheet references. Here's the formula. This formula is volume times by customer mix times by customer price in order to get customer one's income. Really simple, really small formula as well when you look at it. So it should be simple to understand. As soon as you start to move things off of a sheet, and soon, so I'm going to literally cut these and go to another worksheet and paste them. Having pasted them, that very same formula that we were just looking at has now just become 10 times the length and a lot, a lot harder to review. And that's off-sheet references. As soon as you 
as soon as you start using lots of worksheets, there's more and more off-sheet um, references. So please try your best not to put off-sheet references into the model. So I'm going to um, I'm going to undo that. Press Control Z. Chris, a quick question. I, I noticed in your formula, if you go back to yeah, you leave spaces if you hover over one of the, the cells. Um, You've got a nice space between, say, E6 and E10. When I write formula, I just do it straight away. Is that something, is that a macro, or is that part of Excel where you put those spaces in? It does look sort of neat, really. Yeah. Um, OK, little tip. The spaces within Excel, Excel completely ignores all spaces. So you can space out your formulae as you like, and it won't change any difference to the final number. Okay. I normally just put a space in between each point, it just makes it easier to review a formula. Um, as well, whilst we're on that, I suppose we could also just quickly show you that, and if I expand this formula bar, within a, within a cell, within a formula, if I hold down the Alt key and press Enter, I can actually do a carriage return within my formula. Again, Excel mm -hmm. completely ignores it, but if you've got a bit more of a complicated formula, then you can set those into sections to help you review it. And that's just changed that cell to that cell. It gives the same number, it's doing the same thing. It gives the same number, it just helps you make a formula more easy to use. But um, I very rarely use that, and why do I, I very rarely use that because I always try and keep my formulas nice and simple, and that's the next modeling best practice. If everything's on the one worksheet, we've not got off-sheet references in our formula, the next thing is try and keep it nice and simple. We could do very formally if we wanted to, but they only increase risk. So if I try and unhide example two, Example two is exactly what we were just looking at. There's the income for the customer. But I've then just said, OK, there's 20% VAT on that. So there's the VAT proportion. VAT plus VAT is the gross invoice that I'm going to charge to my customer. I've put some implied 30 days cash terms. So if this is one month, I shouldn't be getting any cash in the door. And so that means my trade debtors are outstanding as at the end of the month. And that's really easy to sense check. 10K total income plus 2K for 20% VAT, OK equals 12k, okay, okay, that all makes it really simple. And I think that's the, that's what you should focus on, is just keeping it nice and simple. I'm sure I could have worked out that closing trade debtor position with one formally based on these three inputs, but that wouldn't have added any value. It would have calculated the same number, but all it would have done is increased the risk of possibly getting it wrong, and it would have been harder to see those steps within the formula. So you're breaking it down into its constituent parts so you can clearly see how the transaction flows. Yeah, most definitely. Make sure you keep it nice and simple and break it down into steps. Okay, what that then means is that you then start to use lots of rows. And don't forget, we're on the calculations page. This isn't where our users sit. This is, this is your area. So there's no harm in using lots of rows. In Excel 2007 onwards, we've got over a million rows. So I've just gone down to the bottom there. And in 2003, it's 65,000 rows. You'll never get anywhere close to it. So it's designed to have lots of rows in it. And you're cutting down risk by breaking down your calculations by those steps. OK? So, so put it all in one place and use lots of rows. So it might get a bit big, the sheet, but it doesn't mean it's more complicated. It's actually easy to understand. So it's actually less risky being bigger in size. OK? And that's, 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 that's really the vertical consideration in setting out my calculations page. Next, um, the horizontal way to look at a calculations page. Um, and this is all about unique formulas. Okay, I'm literally going to copy this, everything, including the cell input, paste that across. Oops, there's a mistake. I meant to, so I cut that. So apologies, everybody, this is live. Um, I meant to copy that, not cut it, and then move that across to the 5 n in order to make a, an exact duplicate of my first column. And that's, that's important, an exact duplicate of my first column, because this cell that we looked at to start off with is, is a new formula, is something that's not happened yet. But as soon as I just copy it and place it there, this formula here is, is not unique. It's exactly the same as that. And actually, all of these are exactly the same. It's only the first one that's a unique formula. And so if I can sign off, and I'm happy that I've got that correct, then that means I'm happy that I've got the whole row correct. And so if ever I need to change it in the future, I don't need to remember to update lots of things. I just update the first cell, update that, copy it, and move it to the right. Press Enter, and it's done. And it's quick, and it cuts down risk, because you don't have to remember to go and change period three, which is different to period one, and you'll inevitably forget. And so one unique formula is critical when working out lots of periods. Okay, and to demonstrate that a little bit more, 
is a model map of Go Forecast. Um, what is a model map? A model map is a graphical representation of my model. Okay, um, this is created by a third-party auditing tool software that um, you can purchase and that can basically go over a model and show you graphically what it looks like. There's other things it can give you, but we're using this as a basis to talk you through what is a unique formula. And these red dots are unique formulae, and it's showing Go Forecast, which is a five-year model for 12 months. I've used the very same formula from the start to the end. And so it's built in line with modeling best practice. There's lots of rows, but it's in line with modeling best practice, and it's actually not that complicated because there's only one unique formula. If I show you what it looks like with a, possibly a badly built model, this is the same thing. This is a three-year model, but what this is, is is really a headache from a model auditor's perspective because you have to go through and you have to check absolutely everything. Does this all make sense? I've got VAT payment happening on a quarterly basis like that, which if you change the way your VAT payment calculates, then you have to remember to change that for every single quarter, and it just slows you down significantly and massively increases risk. And this is the auditing functionality that's built into the Go Forecast. It's not something that comes with standard Excel. I use the auditing buttons from time to time, which is useful, but can be a bit cumbersome. Yeah, oh, the auditing tools within Excel are great, and they should be relied on. This isn't actually something that comes with Go Forecast. This is a separate third-party tool that I use in order to send check models and to review my own work to make sure that I don't have a, an incorrect formula halfway through. So it can be purchased. Got it. Okay, so it doesn't come with Go Forecast, but it is something you can use. But still, Excel's inbuilt validations are good as well. But we, we don't really have the time to touch on that today. Okay. But um, but yeah, volume of calculations. Uh, just quick, if the audience are interested or other ideas for future forecasts around things like auditing, please do drop questions in and and let us know. We're very keen to to do additional forecasts in the future. Sorry, Chris, back back to you. Okay, thanks, David. Um. There's lots of calculations on this page, but just because there are lots of calculations doesn't make it complex. There's only one unique formula, and this is a five-year model. If I needed to make it a 25-year model, I just copied it across to all 25 years. It's not got any more complicated. So that's really um, minimizing risk when building a, a calc page. Okay, And we have really only just scratched the surface, but hopefully it's given you some really key modeling best practices to reduce that risk. Okay, we should move now on to formulae. Okay, and, and this is our formula. Um, again, it's a really, really big topic. There's loads of functions, things like that. It's a really big topic, but we're going to give you one of the most important modeling best practices with formulae is never, ever, ever put a value into a formula. Okay, that 500, firstly, that's a lot harder to spot. Okay, you might work that out, but it's a lot harder to spot that that's sitting in there. And so that increases risk, but that 500 is an assumption of some sort, whatever it is. And that assumption um, could be forgotten by the user if it's sitting in your formula. It's not on your general input sheet. It's not highlighted as a separate assumption. It's um, sitting in a formula. So try and avoid it as much as possible. Please do not put numbers into formula. Set it out, put that 500 here with a nice yellow color-coded cell as an assumption to be considered by the user. Okay. Um, we could touch on defined names here. Defined names is a really big part in Excel, and I won't cover it in too much detail. Um, but I could call this this input. I can actually give it a name. I can define it as a name. I'm going to call it price. Okay, and I could have times my volume times by my customer mix times by price, and it's done exactly the same thing. And that's made my formula easy to read. Um, but that 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 input of price can then be referred to throughout the whole model. That £10 is now something that's fixed that can be referred to anywhere. And defined names are really useful. They can be used with data validation, the drop-down list. You put, you define your name of dates, and then you put that as a data validation list. You can almost translate a formula into a written sentence format. Yeah, you can. You can. Yeah. You can. Obviously, you don't want to use it all the time, yeah. but just the really key things that you're often referring to, like VAT as an example. You could put VAT profiles in, and you're always going to be referring to VAT, so define it as a name, and then Put it in, start putting it into your formulae. That's very helpful, very useful. Okay, so so that's really the formulae section other than functions, which is the last part. And what is a function within Excel? Sum is a function within Excel, and the function is the capital letters before the opening of the bracket. 
inside the brackets is the logic. Um, sum is a function, and they, there's hundreds, I think possibly thousands of functions within Excel. And just a couple of tips. Um, hopefully, we're all aware of if. That's really quite an important function. It gets you into logic. I'm not going to go through it today, but some more tips. If you understand if, then what's really important with if is to combine some very simple formulae, or and, min, and max. These functions are really simple functions, but once you start using ifs, if you start using ors and ands and mins and max with ifs, then it starts to reduce and make your formulae a lot um, smaller, a lot more efficient. And therefore, if it's smaller and more efficient, it makes it less error prone. So, ors, ands, min, and max is a great. A couple more just tips of some other really good functions that I use often is index, match, and choose. Okay, people use HLOOKUP, VLOOKUP, things like that, but index and match pretty much replaces those, and they're a lot more powerful, so I hardly ever use HLOOKUP or VLOOKUP. Just focus on index, match, and choose, and they're also really good with data validation. Okay, so if you're going to start to use data validation, you can start to use these three cells in order to work with an input that's inputted via data validation. And finally, some product, okay, worth just trying to learn that. It's really powerful as well. You can do lots with some products. And how do you learn? Press F1. F1 is an inbuilt help system within Excel, and it can teach you lots, okay? We could perhaps cover formally another day, but, um, yeah, again, if you're interested in learning about formulae, that could be the subject of another masterclass. Please do send in uh, your request. Okay, thanks, David. But it's a, it's a big topic, so there's just some tips. There's some good formulae to try and use. Okay, final section now, guys. We're, we're on to tracking performance. And I'm going to dive back into Go Forecast for this now. Back into Go Forecast. Let's shut that down. Back into Go Forecast. Um, the final part, I think, with any forecast, really, is you're, you're projecting into the future. You're doing your year one budget, and then you're doing forecast thereafter. I think with a, um, a, a budget and a forecast, if you can start to bring in your actual performance as you trade throughout that first year, your forecast just becomes so much more valuable because you're actually entrenching them in the month end routine. Every time you do your management accounts and you sign those off, you then put them into the forecast to see what does that do to my projected cash position over time and update it for the true opening balances. Um, getting the actual data in there is really important. Um, Conceptually, it's really easy to understand. It's, if you start to get to variance analysis by putting actual data in, it's, it's really easy to understand one minus the other. But in practice, from a modeling perspective, it's really hard. And it's just hard to tie that opening balance sheet, that historic period. As the historic period moves each month within year one of the budget, it's hard to tie that into the forecast. But, but it can be done. And um, one of the golden rules in trying to do that is making sure that your historic data, so the actual performance, the monthly management accounts, making sure that historic data is um, kept separate to the budget data. Your model needs to be able to handle both sets of data so that the user can change their model to look at, say, month three of actuals or entirely budget data. You've just, you've just got to keep them separate. Um, and just quickly, we're going to change the um, some of the data in in Go Forecast that now incorporate three months to March 12. We won't really go into the detail, but just to show that Go Forecast is now indicating it's not entirely budget data that you're looking at; it's budget plus actuals. And having incorporated that data, we've got different minimum cash positions, more accurate, hopefully, with our actual trading. But we can also then start to look at the differences between our entirely budget data and start to look at our assumptions, including our now three months of data from our historic data tab. And we look at the full year and quarterly variances. So if we do that, and this is built within Go Forecast, it's a, it's a macro-based product. Um, but that, it outputs, the end result is variance analysis. And it gives you variance analysis on all of your financial statements. But if we just look at the P&L account, we can see, here's our full year and there's our quarterly variances. We can see that our EBITDA reduced from budget to actual and budget, so having incorporated three months of data, and it reduced in only a certain couple of areas. So it looks like our marketing figure was different. Now we can go away and 
and investigate that and try and understand why and update our budget if we need to. Uh, Chris, do you still have to manually key the actual information in here? I think it's fantastic output to track uh, the budgets versus actuals. But I know sometimes you can spend a lot of time just keying information as opposed to, to reviewing it. Is there stuff that could be built to maybe automate that process a bit more? Yes, yes, most definitely. There's macros, there's ways we can automate things in order to get it into Go Forecast really easily. As standard, Go Forecast doesn't have that automation in. It's pretty specific to each of your different companies. You're using different systems and things like that. So it's hard to standardize that. But it does have, you can just key in once a month as at the end of your month-end procedures, your management account data. Whether it's Sage, MYOB, or whatever yeah. the system. Just take your management account, key it in, and then get the value of looking at your monthly performance. Got it. Thanks. Okay, that's it really, that's the end of the fourth section, so we're going to go back to our, um, our, pres uh, our slides and finish with a summary, finish with a summary of all of the modeling best practices that we've covered today and what we've got, we've got some do's and don'ts, okay, broken down into the four sections of customization and really it's all about just incorporate those business drivers, just get those in there, they're calculating turnover, it's really material. Minimising risk during the operation stages. Try not to link externally from a workbook. Make sure that the workbook is a self-contained unit, if at all possible. Um, don't use lots and lots of worksheets. It gets harder for the user to understand where they are. Harder to check the assumptions. Next, separate those inputs, outputs, and counts. Loads of benefits there in doing that. Really minimising risk, having done that. Um, if you're going to model cash, make sure you integrate fully with a balance sheet. All three financial statements are where you're modelling cash. Next, if the user's inputting into their cells, use that Excel to validate that they've put the right input in. And also, try and build in your own check system so that the whole model itself is validated and it will notify the user if the balance sheet is in balancing, for example. Next, minimizing risk during the design and build stage. We talked about not using off-sheet references. They make formulas really hard to review with lots of off-sheet references. So try not to use those. And as well, keep it simple. There's no harm in doing it one step at a time. Break those formally down into nice, simple steps. Um, and as well, unique formally is really important. Make sure only one unique formally for all of your rows, and it will speed you up, and it will, again, reduce risk. Finally, formally, we're saying do not include numbers in formally. That's a key model in best practice. And F1 to learn those functions. Finally, tracking performance. I think it's critical in a model. Don't put your model in a... Um, in the drawer every 12 months, use it every month, get your management account performance in there and act accordingly. Thank you. Thanks for listening, everybody. I'll hand back to David. Chris, thank you very much. Uh, I thought that was excellent. Um, I've realized some of the mistakes I've been making the last uh, 20 years. We have had a number of questions in. Just before we uh, dive into those, and please do ask your questions now, guys. We're, um, I think we've got about 20 minutes left, um, if we need it, that is. The, uh, you can get copies of the slides uh, if you ask us. This whole presentation will be on our YouTube channel within 24 hours, uh, SEU Group YouTube channel. Um, and uh, as it says on the screen here, we, we, have, we did ask all of you a question before you signed up. So you've got a good idea of what each of you uh, were looking out of the session. And we know that some of you are interested in a modeling service. So uh, go forecast or not go forecast, if you need help with your modeling, I access to Chris and other members of the FCU Group Network. Please do email us at support at financegopher.com or call in on 0203 008 4495 and talk to a member of the team. Uh, if you are intrigued by Go Forecast, uh, we think you should be. It's a fantastic product. Years of uh, expertise have gone into it. You can dive straight in uh, and have a 30-day free trial. If you go to the website financegopher.com, forward slash tool, have a look at the walkthrough video, it'll give you a deeper understanding of the product itself, and then if you scroll down, you'll see at the minute we've got four different types of models there, one for a property-based business, one for a web-based business, one for a product-based business, and probably the more popular one, the multivariant model, which is sort of a, a more generic model. We are building others, uh, we have a charity one in the works, for example. Uh, it, may, well, it may be that you want one specifically for, uh, for your business, so um, do, do take a look. Okay, just turning to uh, some of the questions. One question, and Chris, if I just invite you back in to help with some of these. Okay. Um, 
One of them is from Mike, uh, maybe late to the presentation. Do you protect your formula? We'll start with an easy one. Yes, yes, I most definitely protect my formula. And yes, I'm using color coding to indicate yellow is the place to um, change a cell. But if I try to change elsewhere because it's formally protected, they would be notified that as well. So, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely protect your formula. Okay. Uh, another question. My SD has left my business. I have limited knowledge of accounting. Is Go Forecast right for me, or should I speak to an expert to help me forecast? I'll, I'll take that one. Um, what, what I would say is we've designed Go Forecast so that if you've got a reasonable understanding of Excel, have a go. Uh, it's fairly intuitive. The instructions are there. But what we're offering is the on-demand support that comes with it. So you might even be in a position where you don't need a full-time SD, uh, oh, sorry, a part-time SD. Someone like Chris, and it probably would be Chris initially, can come in and help you tweak it uh, so the model works to your, to your needs. The whole idea behind the product is you can use it yourself without the need of an SD, uh, particularly for smaller businesses. Uh, it works just as well in larger companies, but it is designed to get entrepreneurs off the ground as well. I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that, Chris. But. I think that's perfect. I think that's perfect, David. Okay. Um, another question. Regarding the input, do you try and ring fence your financial assumptions away from the business trading assumptions, i.e. you wouldn't want someone inputting sales assumptions playing around with VAT? Um, does that mean that you're asking that there's multiple people, there's sales people using this model, and then there's technical people using this model, or I think so. I, I, I interpret that as uh, I, I interpret that as sometimes you do have to give a sales guy or girl access to the model, and the last thing a finance person wants is a sales person getting access to it. I guess you could design the input page the way you wanted it, but yeah, we could. We could obviously separate it in different places. Are they separated within Go Forecast at the minute? Um, no, that is me and my customer turnover assumption because, for example, on that turnover assumption, it's just there that it makes sense to also say, is this battable and what are the trade terms on that one turnover assumption? And then move on to the next turnover assumption. So they are close to each other, but I think that makes more sense to put those assumptions together. Unless, of course, you just say there's different people using it that some people might not even understand that. So to put that next to that input maybe doesn't make sense and can, of course, be structured differently. I would agree with that. In, in my experience, I think one person, wherever possible, needs to own that model. And when they're sitting down and reviewing that detail with the management team, the CEO, it works really well when the person that's running the model is sitting there alongside those individuals, and they are responsible for keying in the detail and organizing sessions to, to that effect. So to be clear, and, and within Go Forecast, it is designed to have multiple people use it. And as soon as you enter Go Forecast, it will say, who last used it, and it will keep version control to show that here's all the previous versions when you saved it and who was using it when they saved it. So it is designed to handle multiple people to come in and use it. I think we didn't touch on that functionality. There is that whole uh, version control and emailing functionality. Is there anything else to add on that, Chris? There's loads of stuff, obviously, that Go Forecast can do. There's loads more that we didn't demonstrate today. We're mainly focusing on the model and best practices. But if you wanted to go, obviously, to the tools page, there's lots more videos on there to show you what else is within Go Forecast. Okay, I think that's uh, all the questions. I'm just looking at my lovely assistant here. Any further questions? No? Okay, well, hopefully that was useful, guys. Uh, it's been great talking to you, and uh, look forward to seeing you on the next webinar. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye.